Good evening everyone, my name's Colin Clark and welcome to Parrot Perspective 76. Um, we are online tonight, as you're well aware. Um, this was always planned to be an online one. Um, we are now in lockdown, back in Victoria again, um, just due to a, a very small number of uh, cases that have escaped from our hotel quarantine. Um, so I hope this is a timely, uh, a bit of evening entertainment for, a, for, the, for the Melbourne people watching. Um, Tonight we've got for you, uh, as usual, some submitted videos from uh, some of our wonderful local poets and also some highlights from our recent live shows. Um, as usual, we'd like to thank Matt and the team at Pride of Our Footscray Community Bar where we hold our, uh, our fortnightly live shows. Um, hopefully they'll still be going ahead. Um, we've got one coming up on the 23rd of February, so next Tuesday, a week today. Um, at this stage, we're not 100% sure what's going to happen with, uh, the, with the government rules on, uh, on our lockdown, but hopefully we'll see as many of you in, in possible live next week. Um, I've really enjoyed the live shows that we've had recently. I had the pleasure to be um, attending all of those shows uh, and taking the recordings, some of which you're going to see tonight from the open mic section. Um, thanks, as always, to Lish, uh, who hosts our regular live show. Um, yeah, aside from that, Let's get into it. Enjoy. With consent, of course. <laughs> Steady, dude. Um, so I, I just was given, um, as, as a birthday present, I was given um, Love is Strong as Death, the poetry anthology uh, compiled and edited by Paul Kelly, which is fantastic. Um, <coughs> so many amazing poets. I, I've been kind of, I've just started to kind of dip in and out of it. Um, and as I was flicking through, um, I was going to do an Auden one because I was in a bad mood when I got here. Uh, and then I looked at it again and went, it's a beautiful poem, but sad as hell. Um, so I thought that I would do this one, it's very short, and I'll do one of mine. Uh, this is Departure, the Arthur Rimbaud poem, as translated by John Ashbury. I just pictured him looking like Rambo. Yeah. Well, he was a revolutionary thing. Um, <laughs> Right. Enough seen. The vision has been encountered in all skies. Enough had. Sounds of cities in the evening and in sunlight and always. Enough known. The stations of life. Oh, sounds and visions. Departure amid new noise and affection. Lovely. Um, I said to somebody earlier tonight, uh, they said, oh, your jacket matches your outfit, matches your shoes. And I said, yeah, I've got a poem to match it and all. Um, appropriately called Blue Glitter Feet. <laughs> so, on purpose, I did not sparkle or glow, stayed wrapped in muted tone. For many years rejected colour, perhaps a splash never more. When was the shift? What mental twist led to these shoes, these blue glitter ridiculous things? I don't consider this to be entirely superficial. There is psychology behind our decisions of what to wear, how we present ourselves to a judgmental world. I have had insults hurled at me for wearing fairly basic hats in, a but, utterly, in but utterly basic place, places, staring and mutters and outright unflattery. Australian menus don't cope well with difference. But when did your propensity for violence merge with this animosity to a semi-fashionable item on a person's head? I have been called a fucking hat wearer. <laughs> And that's a fairly harsh insult in our country. We can agree that novelty doesn't go down well with people who have trouble spelling fedora. 
If it was an Akubra, would you still feel this angst? I won't walk the plank for fashion, but for fuck's sake. At some point, I started changing my own idea of what is acceptable to leave the house in. This doesn't mean at times I don't get nervous. This does not mean I do not wonder if I will remain safe or uninsulted. So what's with the disco ball shoes? Why choose to stand out so far when it is much safer to remain neutral? What the hell is wrong with blundstone boots? It is not trend that drives my choices before you ask in a condescending voice. I am no slave to GQ, Vogue or Harper's Bazaar. Rely on gut instinct to define what I like. Fine with agreeing to disagree. I don't do jackets with three quarter sleeves. If that makes you happy, so be it. My peeve is being pushed to wear something I'm not comfortable in. These shoes do make me dementedly happy. My one criteria for tapping what to buy, to wear when perusing the internet or browsing secondhand stores, does it bring me more joy than other potential items? It does indeed. And why on earth should anyone else mind if I choose to wear this glitter fetish with pride? Another kiss on the pale, cold lips of Madame La Guillotine. The gleaming knife, the bloody framework, the creaking basket. And so the footsteps die out forever. Lead on, Jailer. You are so weary of life's load as I am. The world in which I have done so little and wasted so much fades fast from me, and in its stead, I see the lives of the witch. I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous and happy, in that England which I shall see no more. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts and in the hearts of their descendants. Generations hence, I see her. An old woman weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband lying there in their final earthly bed. Side by side their course done. And I know that each was not more honored and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. I see Marsad and Cly and Defarge, the vengeance, the jurymen, the judge, all long ranks of new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old, perishing by this retributive instrument. The force shall cease out of its present use. see a beautiful city and the brilliant people rising from this abyss and in their struggles to be truly free truly free in their triumphs and defeats through long long years to come I see the evil of this time and of the previous time for which this is its natural birth I 
gradually making expiations of itself and wearing out. I see the child winning who lays upon her bosom who bore my name. A man winning his path in life, my path. That which I once chose and was mine. I see him winning it so well that my name is made illustrious by the light of his own. I see the blots I threw upon it faded away. And him. Foremost of judges, highest honored among men, winning a boy of my name with a forehead that I know, and golden hair to this place, then fair to look upon with not a trace of this day's disfigurement. And I hear him. Tell the child my story with a tender and faltering voice. Farewell, Lucy. Farewell, life. Far, far better thing I do than I have done. It's a far, far better rest that I go to than I have known. Charles Dickens, a tale of two cities, and thank you very much. And I've got a poem which basically is one, and I'm going to try it out no. tonight. It is called Paint Colours. <laughs> Who names the colours on a paint brochure? Can you make a colour more attractive by calling it Fandangle? <laughs> I didn't know Fandangles are green, but then again, I didn't know Spatial Spirit, Jazzercise and Keen Wind a green too. <laughs> One brochure says, the soft warmth of cotton tail, a colour, complement the natural tones, different colours, in the furniture. <laughs> Wax way, another colour, contrasts with the powerful presence of red terror. Aha. Created with elegant simplicity, this is all to create a mood or change the way you feel with inspirational room colours. Righto. <laughs> how about a range of colours called how you make me feel like dull bastard beige or annoying prep purple. <laughs> create mystery and intrigue with the tinting machines on the blink again brown or I don't care if you wanted blue anyway puce. <laughs> Only one Barocca would have been enough yellow. <laughs> That's more realistic. Not like the colour called gumboot. I've never seen a gumboot that colour. I'd call it what the gumboot stepped in. <laughs> the most accurate name I saw was black and green. It's not green at all. It's black. Maybe it could be renamed the green bit was c crossed out or the green before it was run over. <laughs> they all seem to have a heritage range. This range could be called, hey, let's look like our neighbours, or <laughs> see what those colour Nazis in the council made us do. <laughs> then, there is the effects range. It takes two coats, brushed differently of course, to get Venus vibe, suave rose, <laughs> sapphire burst, and, wait for it, latte. <laughs> the brochure says, 
admire the finish. Admire this finish. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I hope they like it. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, this one. This this one's called um, called the words. The words well up inside me until they are a sea. Do I say it now? And the monsters deep deep down cannot swallow it all. The words crash in waves, form currents and tides pulled by the moon. Do I say it now? I wait until it's calm and plunge in. But the words choke and pull me under. Do I say it now? I struggle against them, away from the monsters, towards you. Say it. I stand on the edge of my mind, coughing on my words, and you are there. Say it now. And so am I. Yes, say it now. I love you. And I breathe once more. Um, yeah, the um, poetry at the Dan O'Connell, which happened every Saturday for the last 24 years, uh, which is now at the Cherry Tree Hotel, um, that they used to have a competition uh, every now and then, and they'd, um, they'd give you a line, and you had to include it in a particular poem, and this particular line was, the rain only strikes me every seventh drop. Oh, I uh, won that one. Is, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful line, but um, um, I went down the stupid path, and um, and I, I wanted uh, and and I absolutely made myself the first one on the stage to do this one. Uh, this one's called Poetry Mafia. <laughs> nice establishment you have here. <laughs> Real classy like. <laughs> classy establishments like this one need protection. <laughs> you never know what sort of poet might come here bringing down the tone and frightening the patrons. Oh, there are bad ones. Real nasty like. They know all the dirty tricks like tapping the microphone saying, <laughs> is this is working? To no one in particular and they're not using it. <laughs> Mispronunciating words, <laughs> reading the latest work in progress chapter of their epic novel entitled If Only I Could Write. Horrible <laughs> <laughs> use of a ballpoint pun. Whoa. So you better start paying protection money or you'll get more cliches than you can poke a stick at. <laughs> better force, so mixed you'll be driven up the wall without a paddle. <laughs> And you never know where they got their lines, like, the rain only strikes me every seventh drop. <laughs> dear, oh dear, they're vicious. You'll be hearing that line if you don't watch it. You don't want that sort of poet here, do you? So cough up, or we'll send our poets round. <laughs> Hi. This poem was written by Adriana Delia Collins in 1970. Two merchants set out upon the sands to sell their wares in distant lands. A common destination between them was had as they left the streets of old Baghdad. On camel's back they traveled for seven days with the bright sun above setting the desert ablaze. But on the morning of the eighth day, the merchants encountered their first delay. For to the plague from whence they had come did one of the merchants finally succumb. The symptoms of this disease were very grave, and from its grip few were saved. I must go on, said the merchant to the ill, so that the coffers of my business may be filled. You must stay with me, was the urgent plea, to care for my pains and give me ease. Or the least you can do is to end my distress instead of leaving me comfortless. Oh, poor man, I can't end your strife, for by the good Lord above I can take no life. Therefore, I must leave you now. I will leave you with what I can allow. And so the ailing merchant was left to die as his friend went on for those sacred buys. But upon reaching the town of his journey, he could not enter by a pasha's decree. The terms of the law were very vague, something about his bearing some plague. 
Um, so I'm reading from the same book as Colin, so Cheshire Born by John Wright. Um, and um, if you haven't heard this before, there's a little Cheshire saying, which is Cheshire born, Cheshire bred, strong in the arm, thick in the head. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now, now Colin also, although he's from London, does a far better Cheshire accent than me. Mine seems to have drifted over the years, so um, you're just going to have to go with what I've got. So this is called Lowry Man to L.S. Lowry. I'm a Lowry splodge, gripping limbo by the collar of life's worn out overcoat, in futile headbutts against eternal drizzle, loitering on grimy corners, littered with dogs and dodgy mops. In the final glow of my last woodbine, smoked all the way to blisters on the lip, I shuffle to or from work, or death, or nowhere in particular, along terraces marked for demolition. I'm a cloth-capped, cobble-clogged immortal, smeared in the likeness of God, the painter of my creator. Ready any night for a fight, after fish and chips and a few pints. I've been granted life eternal, framed in galleries around the world, famous as the symbol of nil, a grain of the salt of the earth, insignificant as the universe. So I'm going to read a poem from this book, Turbulence. It came out last year. Uh, it's by Thai Un. I hope I said her name correctly. Um, this is called Hemorrhage. A necklace of bloody beads is trailing behind me, hitting the pavement, deep, blossoming rubies. This heart gape, this shape, trickle a leak. I look down in surprise, oh mouthed there. Could be so much seepage still. I thought plasma cells and these eye salts were exhausted. Beyond my shoulder, these strain, these stains they follow, and every step a rhythmic beat, such metallic puddles. Um, and I chose that poem because uh, I think it sort of leads into my poem quite nicely, although her poem is way much better. Um, so I haven't named this poem, I'll just read it, you'll get the gist. I first met my heart when it blobbed out on the earth, seeping steadily, blood to ground. Soon the red spread all around. Before, we'd only spoken on the phone, sent a few emails, and in times gone by there had been faxing. Yet now I face my heart if I stare straight down, like a scarlet slug, a liquid sign, water, bomb, one quick smack and the whole thing's gone. And who can stitch up disposable rubber to gather together emotional blubber? I carried on heartless, feeling more than ever, with nothing to give. Turned out I had spare. The more that was taken, the more that was there. Supplies and supplies, all the sensitive me, with moods made of china, dreams as deep as the sea. Perhaps that bloody bogey my chest had hacked up. It wasn't my heart, it was just something yuck. Or perhaps hearts are like eggs in the ovaries, thousands for a life, endless possibilities. Yeah, I don't feel good. I have no scented core. I'm spreading and spewing, can't take any more. So I pray to the heavens, to the spirits, to the trees. It doesn't really matter who will listen to me. Please make my heart indomitable. So it grew to the size of an oak. Its case as tough as stiff bark skin, with a spine like the base of a bed. All was mighty, towering, bulking, monumental. Yet one stormy night, a single crack of lightning split my trunk heart apart. Electricity jumped from twig to roots, leaving cooked smoky bark. So I prayed to the fairies for a heart made of reeds. 
Something that can duck and bend, not an organ that easily bleeds. I pray to the boggets, dwarves, trolls and gnomes, for they are small and shifty. A heart that can swerve and dodge is much more thrifty. But I haven't got a reedy heart, so still I pray and pray. If I don't get the core I need, I won't live out all my days. The challenge looming up ahead is worse now more than ever. Please grant me a heart of reeds so that I may live forever. Hello, my name is Denise Chapman, and I have three poems to share with you. Of those three poems, two of them um, belong to other folks. And so I guess that's in the spirit of poetry perspectives in, in that we, we share poems of other people, um, poems that we really enjoy and love and bring us um, a different perspective, a poetry perspective. So this first poem is by Audre Lorde and it's entitled Kitchen Linoleum. The cockroach who is dying and the woman who is blind agree not to notice each other's shame. And this next poem, it was a short one, wasn't it? <laughs> and this next poem is by Sterling A. Brown and it's entitled After Winter. He snuggled his fingers in the blacker lum. The lean months are done with the fat to come. His eyes were set on the brushwood fire, but his heart is soaring higher and higher. Though he stands ragged, an old scarecrow, this is the way his swift thoughts go. Butter beans for Clara, sugar corn for Grace, and for the little fella, run in space. Radishes and lettuce, eggplants and beets, turnips for de winter, and candied sweets. Homespun tobacco, <laughs> apples in de bin for smoking and for cigars when folks drop in. He thinks with the winter, his troubles are gone. 10 acres unplanted to raise dreams on. The lean months are done with the fat to come. His hopes winter wanders hasten home. Butter beans for Clara, sugar corn for Grace, and for the little fella, running space. And this last poem is one of my own and it's entitled, Standing Tall for the Future. On days that I say to self, be small, be a shadow, on a dull, damp day. Tuck your voice in your wallet. I see my girls, their eyes etching all. So I straighten my spine, turn my chin towards my ancestors, wrap my head with, with a crown of color. So my girls see that they can be even taller than me. Thank you. Thanks, Lish. Uh, I've got two poems tonight, one retrospective and one my own. The retrospective one is really powerful and yeah, really moved me, so I'll read mine first. My, this first poem is about love and aliens. The alien stories are true, and so is the love story. It's called Close Encounters. The moment you doubt you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. J.M. Barry, 1904. 
Your voice held an urgency. You have to see this. A long line of lights moving across the night sky, otherworldly. Aliens exist, we whispered. Waking to suburban crop circles, the cooch grass burnt, your childhood <coughs> memory of signs. The body falls going nowhere on cusp of dreams, all the little and big mysteries, God and birth and time and other big ticket items. I can't believe it's not butter and celebrity survivor. And do we ever truly believe that we can die? Coincidence is a tuning fork you only heard because you were listening. And then there is love, suspending the universal laws of everything. Turns out that string of lights would belong to Elon Musk, another multi-million dollar space project advancing mankind or some such. And you and I, in love, remain two aliens plotting with each brief encounter, our earthly invasion. Some of you might have heard this poem, I'm not sure, but when I read it first, it really moved me, um, especially given Australia's uh, terrible abuse of human rights in our treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. It's called Home by Warsan Shire, and I hope I get through it all right. <laughs> <coughs> No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbours running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper <coughs> unless the miles travelled means something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it, no one could stomach it, no one's skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks Refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers sucking out country dry with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their country and now they want to mess up ours. How do the words, the dirty looks roll off your backs? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun, and no one would leave home, unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, Forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here.
Three hours later. Yeah, no, no reply. <laughs> this one's called Summertime. It is the summer of 1975-76. School holidays have arrived. The smell of coconut oil. A little or no sunburn cream. Only zinc to protect our noses. Suntans were something to be proud of. Above ground swimming pools, lilos, banana lounges, water mats, sprinklers, and laughing children. My father wearing a hanky with the four corners tied in knots to protect his balding head. Blisters on our shoulder blades. Mum would pour cold tea on my back to soothe the raging fire. I remember sleeping in my front for a week to manage the pain. We would peel strips from our arms and legs. My siblings and I would measure each strip to gauge who would be the summertime champion. It was a little macabre, but we used to place them on the windowsill. I felt like a shedding snake. My brother would mow a cricket pitch for our five-day test match. Neighbours would gather to form two equal teams. I was the youngest and least skilled. Always the last pick. All right, I'll take the little guy, my brother always say. Everyone would take the names of their favourite player. Greg Chappell, Dennis Lilly, Michael Holding and even Clive Lloyd. Cordial at 11am. Sandwiches at 12.30pm. Cordial again at 2pm. I cried for two days when our neighbour Paul broke my cricket bat that I got from Santa. Not me. No, not Paul. Um, we played with glue and tape in a test match. It was never the same. I stepped on a bull ant's nest, retrieving a six from the north paddock. I was on the sidelines for the remainder of the test. I was our own Richie Benno, commentating through a megaphone. We were having so much fun. We lose track of the days and weeks. I always knew when summer holidays would come to an end. Mum would take us to the shoe store for our, to fit our shoes, school shoes, one size larger to allow for growing feet. Barter Scout sh school shoes with a big cat paw tread were all the, the trend. A complimentary compass was a bonus. I always got lost. My north was east and my south was west. My school uniform was a hand-me-down from my older brother. I was the only kid that started the school year with a faded uniform. Goodbye, summer for another year. Thank you. I run around my dream within myself trying to rebuild my cervix with nails and wood, touch translucent ovaries, checking their ripeness, the eggs, orange suns. I struggle with beams that fall into nothing. My tubes are too fibrous. I rip them apart. The red becomes redder. There's blood all around me. I'm naked, looking up at my heart. Its beat is irregular. I can't slow it down. I jump, fall into the dark. Disputably not alien, does not apply, data not available, definitely not attractive. Do not ask, do not assume, did not attend, daytime, nighttime, any time. Develop mental needs analysis, digital network architecture. Do not abbreviate. That's good. Right, you're not perfect. No, I think okay. it's good. I'm not doing one of my own tonight. I'm going to do one by a gentleman called Steve Smart. Hey! Who's that? I don't know, some, some poet. Some and, and this is called 
the secret of pine nuts. I think this is a, um, an older poem, but I found it, and I liked it. Take your anger, your pain, your frustration. Place them in a bowl and beat them. Beat them till your arm aches. This is about passion. Turn on the stove, heat your pan, oil first, then spices, then the rest. Don't be afraid of spices. Don't go easy. Sometimes that half a teaspoon just isn't enough. Heap it in. It's more fun that way. There's no such thing as too much garlic. It's a myth, perpetuated by people with boring palates. And use the good oil. It does make a difference. Cheap vegetable oil is fine for greasing pans, not for cooking in them. Meat or no meat, you are free to choose. And vegetarian or not, no one needs meat with every meal. Plus, you know, we have a planet to sustain. And eating your own waiting cow every day, frankly, doesn't help the situation. Fuck off! <laughs> really, the most important thing, the true secret of cooking, is improvisation. It's in what flavours, what herbs, oils, sauces you choose. That's what makes a meal. Are you willing to throw the recipe book to the wind and trust your own instincts? You know what you like, you know what tastes good, and if your decisions seem odd to some, well, who's asking? Take control of the kitchen, use your creativity. Don't be beholden to someone else's ideas. This is an art form, the oldest art form. This is art and religion. This is the reason you feast on holidays. This is about more than getting your food from point A to B. It's about sustenance, true, but this is about giving and receiving. This is good for you in ways your stomach couldn't even imagine. So make every meal a celebration. And if it burns a little, don't freak out. Don't automatically assume that all hope is lost and throw the whole thing away. What's wrong with a little charcoal? Just add more red wine, more chilli sauce, more garlic. Don't scrape the bottom of the pot when you dish up and who's to know? Cook plenty, eat till you're full. If we were meant to eat like sparrows, we would have been born with wings and tiny little stomachs. But we weren't. And anyway, you have a fridge to put leftovers in. Not to say that you should make a pig of yourself, but enjoy cooking and enjoy what you have cooked. This should be a joyful, visceral experience. Don't hold back. Put in everything you are. Imagine you are putting your soul over that flame. Try new things. Try something you thought you'd never enjoy. Maybe it was just the way it was cooked. Asparagus is only as bad as the person cooking it. <laughs> and remember this above all else. Pine nuts go with everything. And anyone who says different is a liar and will have me to answer to. Plus, pine nuts come from pine trees and it's Christmas. So don't be a Scrooge. Add that extra handful, you'll feel better for it. Thank you. The heterosexual knack. I just don't have the heterosexual knack like my Sharona. I desire in reverse of the heterosexual knack. Reading queer theory in bed simulates having it off with a lover. The Khan's desire is diamondiferous. Wow, that's great, she responded to the queer theory, like it was her lover after bringing her to orgasm. Telling her to stop reading French post-structuralist theorists was like telling her to stop breathing. She reads lesbian erotica to be politically correct, secretly imagining a man as the leading female character. When she writes lesbian erotica, she thinks of a man she desires and gives him a sex change. I'm only happy when I have a new boy to write about. I'm his fan. He's my fan fiction. I wanted him to tie me to the chair and force me to write lesbian erotica like Colette's husband. 
unsuspecting men don't realise they're my research material, but they're so vain, they probably think this book is about them. <laughs> With each degree I undertake, my epistemophilia increases. My guilt for contaminating one body only leads to the expiration of more bodies. One fetish replicates another. I want every object, my beloved contacts, a stroke of incarnation, creating a multiplication of stamen points of desire. A man, a man, it has to be a man. <laughs> Hi Lish, hi Colin, great to be with you again. Uh, this is another one of my love songs of the socially distanced. It's uh, number three and it's called Millicent and Percival. Oh, when innocent Millicent met the respectable Percival she was, feeling quite over the moon, he said, we should get married quite soon. Well, the wedding was wonderful. They were all happy and carefree and gay. Came the night and they both drew away to our room where they heard a voice say, Let's maintain a distance of 1.5 metres. Did you hear, dear? Yes, I heard, dear. Do you think we... That's absurd, dear. Oh, I'm longing. Say the word, dear. Then they started to shiver and shake. So he neatly unbuttoned his shirt. She slipped out of her stockings and bra. He neatly laid his pants down by his shoes. She leaned forward, lips slightly apart. Covid safe, Covid novel. Let's maintain a distance of 1.5 metres. Perhaps we should, we could. It just doesn't sound very nice. But if we could, we should. We must follow safety advice. Perhaps like this. But how? Oh, darling, I'm really too shy. Let's go with this for now. Yes, we'll give it the old college try. So, in synthesized, synchronized bliss, they made a synth synthesized, synchronized kiss. They both started to move and to sway, each from 1.5 meters away. Yes, with Percival's Percy intent, then our Millicent started a scent. They began then to gasp and to sigh when the voice came in over their cry. COVID safe, COVID normal. Remember to wear a face mask at all times. Staying apart keeps us together, together, together. Oh, I just don't feel ready tonight. Thank you very much. I read a poem, a, a piece. I'm writing a large thing called Sunshine Psychedelic, and um, I've made a character I called um, called um, Rock and Roll Yobo, and I'm doing a concept album for the book called uh, Electric Yobo Land. It's <laughs> yes, it's uh, bringing the bogan back. It's, Making the book, but this is the, this is the making of that idea. It's not the idea; it's the making of it. And this is how it came about. After a dry spell of writing, it seems so long now that I nearly forget. But there's a tomato plant growing out of some bricks in the backyard, unprovoked. It's near where I piss when I, the toilet is not an option. Something edible is growing from nowhere. An inspiration to the creation or attempt at creating of something from nothing. Words where there were none. Images not your own beginning to flicker like an old found slave machine in an attic full of things forgotten only for the want of the heads projected to shine a light in the right spot upstairs. Send those images out the same way they came in through the peepholes. I have memories of looking out through peepholes on pirate ships from books I've forgotten reading. The inside projector spurred on by the unprovoked tomorrows through concrete is shining a light on once more. The last, thing I, last night I spoke to a lawyer in a gentrified pub about ADHD medication for kids and which was the best Narnia book. I said Dawn Threader, he said another, but why mention Dawn Threader now? Well, it's got boats and peepholes in it. One thing me and the lawyer could agree on was Mr. Tomnus was the most creepy, pedophile, rapey character in Rome. <laughs> the pub was in Brunswick, not far from a house we called Base in 2007, full of people willing to stay up all night, grow their beards out, continually drink and smoke and make psychedelic music in a room kitted with drums, guitars, metals, a nose that when twisted made sound bent into shapes that if you had taken off magic mushrooms would make, take on colours. 
It was the kind of sound you see, not hear, when the going was good, really good, a 24-hour open-door policy that me and a Bosnian filmmaker, now painter, would avail ourselves of as we drank around the night streets looking for an idea of what to do next. Of course he wasn't really an artist then and I wasn't really a writer. We were messes on a mission without ever finding out what that mission was. Anyway, around the corner from base was my old mate Dave's, a chef who'd owned Brunswick Street shops in the 80s, who had a second-hand antique shop, but not a front for the way being knocked out the back door. The kitchen in that place had proper Melbourne rarities. Old situationist playwrights, Aboriginal TV personalities, people who were in a circus, poets, musicians, painters and a lot of so-called ordinary people scoring highly priced but very decent weed. The thing about Dave was I met him in an AA meeting a few years before, and we became friends, but this was as far from AA as far from far gets. That place was open most hours before 12, and plenty of crack, if you were willing to put in. I believe in the pure put-in nature of crack. Like all good things, if you're willing to put in, add to, do your bit, the crack gets better. Damn a curse from crack vampires coming on in, adding nothing, sponging up, lapping it in like greedy little kittens. Expecting attention and feeding without offering anything other than a potential purr or a slight moan of appreciation. Anyway, those two houses in 2007 were right near the pub in Brunswick. I used to be divey but goody, a place you could have sunk down deep in the dank. Now it was middle-aged and polenta chips at $14 a scud. <laughs> the lawyer was part of the gentrification, and if I'm to be honest, I was as well. Outside over the street, they'd knocked down the terraced houses and put up some Eastern European looking slums, three stories populated by no one on less than 100,000 a year. What I'm saying is, it looks shit. There was no escaping its shitness. The front of the building had flats that had doors that opened onto the street, a front window looking at the footpath. They were like shitty chalets in 1980s Butlins. Mid-Brunswick 2021. About that Bosnian artist slice friend, we recently convened in another friend's in North Bowen over Christmas. First time in five years. The beginning was much like it finished, very mangled. A lot of nonsense, cloudy with the chance of benders. And the bender is sure, and we left the house early morning to get tobacco, and there was, we were only a few streets away when we realized we were lost. It was round about then we split another acid and talked to some trees for a while until we managed to stop an early morning cyclist and asked him where we were. He was dressed in blue, a really tight rubber outfit and looked like a superhero. I told him so as well. He took that compliment as I intended it and directed us up to the BP, not that far away but a long time from those directions until we got there because of how much we were laughing. <laughs> We were doing, because of how much we were laughing, we were doing, he said, as we neared the garage, we are reinventing the crack. He was right too, and we both knew we could still do it together, after we laughed in the Uber the whole way to sunshine. It wasn't like ha ha laughing, it was the kind of laughing that makes you scream and lose your breath. The driver seemed okay with it, and we were saying the names of Nazis to each other. I kept, I kept saying he was Martin Bowman, and he said I made a good goring. So I was waving out the window of the taxi like a royal dignitary saying, I like Nazi goring, Nazi goring, Nazi goring. And he started saying it, and we must have said Nazi goring to each other for 10 minutes. It was getting harder and harder to breathe with the laughing. It was the most laughing in a long, long time. And when we got back to the house, there was a solitary bottle of Portuguese red. We drank gently into the afternoon. Then, up the street, one pint later, he said, it's over. And it was for him. And we both knew we could still do it. It had been five years, but not a moment had passed between us, really. Reinventing the crack, he said. Let's leave it another five years, shall we? I said, that's, that's fine. But on Tuesday, he messaged looking for a weed. Right. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hey. Oh, I haven't done this in so long. But it's like riding a mic. <laughs> I always think I'm like a comedian when I am on stage. I'm going to read a piece that's not mine first, just to warm me up. Um, so this is City of Grief Woo! by <laughs> by Vijay Shishradi. 
No one needs an explanation here for what happened. It happened is the explanation. No one here belongs to a race, an empire, a nation, only to this unmappable landlocked film noir city situated in eternity. They live by night here. The time here is local time. The crime is local crime. The girl with the name she stole from her dead sister, the dead man in the lake, know that things are the same forever. Sameness is their essence. Nothing here is sinister because nothing is at stake. Everything is null and void of depth, of resonance. Not real, not real but celluloid. Yesterday was yesterday. Today is today. And no one cares why one <laughs> No one cares why one becomes the other, no one but the private eye, <coughs> the gumshoe, the bird dog standing in for us, our body double, our fedora sporting anachronistic obsolete consciousness, who is always tortured by what he can't understand, who hires himself to investigate himself, who cooks his dinner for one, and tries to think through what can't be thought through. The black wine is aerating. The pasta is limp and waiting to be sourced and tossed. There is a clue to find. There is an innocence to establish and an anguish in him he needs to destroy before it destroys him. An anguish so pure, it almost feels like joy. I've kind of, I've been really obsessed with death lately, <laughs> in like a fun way. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a piece that I wrote kind of like reflecting on that. Um, it's called Moribund. This is not a thing of beauty, nor the abject object of discontent. It is a clawing, crawling, crippling death. The reaper and the knell conjoined. I am not the speaker. You are not the reader. We are not who we should be anymore. December 7th, 1992. My dearest no one, it is your birthday. This is not a lie nor the truth in its entirety. You will die soon. I cannot apologize for inevitability. All you have yet to achieve is wholly pointless. The trajectory is set. The compass biased by its own magnitude. This life will make marauders of us all. Do not go home. Stay a while. Leave the kettle to cool. Mismatch the socks. Make the most intentional mistakes. You are worthy of them all. P.S. If you should be so foolish as to fall in love, write poetry instead. Forget everything that was meant to be. Strip the scripting from the scripture. These hallowed pages were always soaked in pagan ink, in forest raven pasted against mute swan, congregations likened to flocks, their hearts tipping against the plume of mart. Is this all that will remain after life? Act two, interior, casket, day. The body lies dormant in the blackness. There is only silence, decomposing matter and the void. No one, I expected something more. Cut to exterior, cemetery, night. The funeral procession is gone. A lone figure looms above the fresh grave, lights a cigarette, narrator, Voiceover, ashes to ashes, dust to despair. See, remember when this sawed us in half? Did you forget our incorrect expectation to make art from our discarded viscera, our incompetent exercise in bloodletting? All we wanted was to be known as men of letters, instead scrawled illegible scribblings as sigils scratched in our eyelids. Words, words to ward Quran on our final journey. Epitaph. Engraving and entombing are two very different methods of the same preservation. 
May this last an eternity. Forgive me. I am as troubled as I am persistent and do not intend to leave destruction in my wake. These now trampled chrysanthemums remind me only dead things belong here. I remain as unseen as a twist of the Gyges ring, unjust in disappearing. Okay. I actually did this on the the morning of the US election before the before we knew the outcome back in November. Um, and the, the first verse of this is um, uh, the opening verse or translation of the opening verse from Dante's Inferno. All right. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. In a future further from now than we are from the start, the sun will have consumed enough of its hydrogen fuel that gravity will no longer hold it together. The sun, that life-giving star, will expand in a cloud of superheated gas and boil the earth. After that, our atoms will slow and cool, and along with the rest of creation, patiently wait for the heat death of the universe. Trump might win tomorrow, but good in America will continue. If Trump loses, society will not be spontaneously better, although it will be measurably, demonstrably better. There is a point in the journey of each day where it is too late for coffee and too soon for gin. In that balance between gravity and the inferno, in the grace before it is all over, we can vote and dance and rage like there is the only meaning in life. For in that moment, that is all there is. All right, and this other one, uh, I'm not sure whether it's called Blues in A or Johnny Be Good. I think we might go with Johnny Be Good. It's uh, an, an attempt at a verse poem. All right. One, two, one, two, three, four. Strum, strum, strum. Count, two, three. Change fingers, A to D. Where am I up to? Three, four. Change, back to A. No, D, there. Ah, and that's not right. Here, and change, E7, too late, back to D, count, two, three, strum, 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 three beats to the bar, a phrase with no meaning, as I find the beat just in time for the chorus. The song is there in my head, sing the words, chords a step behind, the fingers can catch up with the heart in time for the verse. Sing, I'll work out if I'm in the right key later. All rhythm, strum, 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 back to A, wonky blues, missing chords, laughter will smooth the cracks. Thank you. What a lovely night. Um, I, um, <laughs> the first one I want to do is, um, Oh, I went to see Nomadland yesterday, and I don't know if anyone's seen it. Don't go if you want an action movie, you don't get it. but um, it is quiet and quite lovely. But uh, it also deals with just an older woman, and that's remarkable in itself. But um, it reminded me of this poem by Adrienne Ridge, so I'm going to read this one first. It's called Song. You're wondering if I'm lonely. Okay then, yes, I'm lonely as a plane rides lonely and level on its radio beam, aiming across the Rockies for the blue strung isles of an airfield on the ocean. You want to ask, am I lonely? Well, of course, lonely as a woman driving across country day after day leaving behind mile after mile little towns she might have stopped and lived and died in lonely. If I'm lonely, it must be the loneliness of waking first, of breathing dawn's first cold breath on the city, of being the one awake in a house wrapped in sleep. If 
I'm lonely. It's with the rowboat, ice fast on the shore, in the last red light of the year, that knows what it is, that knows it's neither ice nor mud, nor winter light, but wood with a gift for burning. Um, this one is um, probably what Tim would call a, so call a soppy bugger one, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's called Piano Concerto Number no. Two. I could do with Cameron up here actually doing this one, but um, Cameron, thank you for a, a wonderful set. Um, so, an upstairs flat in Leeds, the broken bed with Shostakovich playing and the red and cobalt glass that throws splashes of light across your chest. This feeling that we might not ever move from here again. My arm at rest upon your hip, the piano calm and Dante, settling sweetly on that long and lovely movement, following the strong triumphant wildness of the earlier score, awash with newness, and with something raw and tender that I don't yet understand. Your breath, the dusty ceiling rose, your hand, its fingers curled in mine. So let me keep this record as the music dims, as sleep drifts in, the cracking stylus, your soft face, and evening shadows slipping into place. Mm. I couldn't believe my luck. Couldn't rifle through my own armory for a shot. My fences are too old for what I'd hoped to hold. Back won't take the rocks. Hips hang a broken swing. Can't break the ground like I used to. Tell me a reason for believing you. I am hand-to-heart dyslexic. Caught in rain so fine, thought it was light falling. Didn't know hope till I was wet with it. The tears of a teenager gushed a dry bed river. The doorbell rung out, turned into one knock after another. But if I could just stay up a little longer... Take a good night by the hands and dance with it. If the sky would take me back, I would turn to water and hang in the air till all of us shone together. Once I thought, in distant times, when the buildings have collapsed in which I live and the ships have rotted in which I travelled, my name will still be mentioned with others. Because I praised the useful, which, in my day, was considered base, because I battled against all religions, because I fought oppression or for another reason, Because I was for people and entrusted everything to them, thereby honouring them. Because I wrote verses and enriched the language. Because I taught practical behaviour or for some other reason. Therefore I thought my name would still be mentioned on a stone. My name would stand from books. It would get printed into the new books. But today, I accept that it will be forgotten. Why should the baker be asked for if there is enough bread? Why should the snow be praised that has melted if new snowfalls are impending? Why should there be a past if there is a future? Why should my name be mentioned?
And that brings another poetry perspective to its end. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the performances of some wonderful stuff in there, as always. Um, yep, if you can make it along to our next show, hopefully on the 23rd of February at Pride of Our Footscray, we'd love to see you. Um, all the details are on the social media. Um, we'll be announcing features and, and all that good stuff as we go forwards. Um, so fingers crossed that goes ahead. In the meantime, all you in Victoria, stay safe, wear your masks, keep, uh, keep yourself safe, out of, out of harm's way. Um, and hopefully we'll get over this little temporary blip and we'll all be out and about in all good time. So this is me signing off from the Crap Art Studio out here in central Victoria. Um, have a lovely week, folks, and I hope to see you soon. Bye now.